Thank you, Ray. Um, in the Republic of Ireland, Oliver Cromwell is perceived as a genocidal tyrant. After King Charles I had been beheaded, Irish Confederates united with his son, who would later become Charles II, to defy Cromwell, the new ruler of mainland Britain. Fearing a counter-revolutionary attack from Ireland, Cromwell preemptively invaded. At the siege, siege of Drogheda, thousands were massacred. The memory poisons Anglo-Irish relations to this day. This autumn, the definitive record of Cromwell's actions was published in five volumes of letters, writings and speeches with material drawn from over 1,000 texts. Was Cromwell guilty of war crimes or did he act within the boundaries of conventional warfare in the 17th century? One Irish amateur historian has spent three decades attempting to convince his compatriots that Oliver Cromwell was not genocidal, but honourable and decent. Tom Riley, who's from Drogheda, says we should regret blackening Cromwell's name and perpetuating a version that damages Anglo-Irish relations. He joins me now from Ireland and also history professor Ronald Hutton from Bristol University. Um, so first of all, uh, Tom, you have, been you have been researching this. How is it that you've been so brave as to produce a different version of what we should think about Oliver Cromwell? Well, as you pointed out, Michael, I am from Drogheda and it, I'm a very unusual animal in this particular scenario. Um, but yeah, I've done the research. Um, I've written four books on the guy. Um, I, I'll just give you an example. Even today, in 2022, there is a school book that actually uses the words uh, about Drogheda that says three and a half thousand inhabitants were massacred. And it goes on to say that 4,000 people were killed in Wexford. Um, now, none of those statements are at, at all accurate in any way, shape or form. Um, interestingly, I emailed uh, 13 academics to point this out to them. I didn't get a response from anybody. Um, I'm very absolutely totally convinced of uh, my research. Uh, Cromwell is much maligned. He is the bogeyman. And as you rightly said, uh, that uh, particular you know, thing, him being a bogeyman, has infected uh, Anglo-Irish relations for years. And it still infects them today. I mean, you know, when you consider that this stuff is being taught to young children from the age of 12 to 15, and um, Cromwell has been used in the past to justify atrocities in the north, and, you know, with the situation up there and, you know, border polls been taking place at the moment, and, you know, there are rumblings uh, that there could be a, a, a return to some sort of violence. So I, I firmly believe that we really should teach children at least, and people in general, that Cromwell did not uh, engage uh, unarmed men, women, and children in particular in the conflict. Uh, Tom, therefore, what did he do? Are you simply saying that the numbers are smaller than the ones that you just quoted? Uh, and, uh, but you also appear to be saying that he did not uh, penalise innocent civilians. Uh, can, you, can you defend those two statements? Absolutely. Well, I suppose the, the, the point I'm making is that he didn't massacre or kill people who weren't in arms. Uh, for instance, at Drogheda and Wexford, there are no eyewitness uh, attestations that any of that happened. Um, the, the, all of the evidence, if you, if you assemble it all together, even his orders when he arrived in Ireland was very specifically to uh, not harm uh, or do any violence whatsoever to persons whatsoever unless they are actually in arms or office with the enemy. Um, and that's very clear. And, and you know, when you, when you take every piece of evidence of the day and all the people who wrote and 30% of the population could write um, and all the accounts we have, um, th there's, there's really no other conclusion you can come to. One of the main things that I find is when I went down to my local records here in Drada, something I had been told about when I went to school is that the, the, va the vast majority of the population was wiped out. Yet, you know, lo and behold, um, looking at the corporation records, there are hundreds of names of people who existed who went about their daily business immediately following the siege. So that was the, the, the seed that was planted for me in the first instance. And of course, as I investigated it all over a period of significant number of years, and I'm still investigating it, uh, uh, you know, it's, it just it began to completely unravel. And I would challenge any historian out there to, to um, point to the fact that, that I'm completely wrong, because I know I'm not. 
We're, we're, we're able to challenge someone straight away, Professor Ronald Hutton. What, what do you make of Tom Riley's research here? Well, I think Tom's a very nice man, and I think that he has done useful work in contending with uh, a very wrong nationalist myth. Uh, there, there are three things about what happened at Drogheda upon which all experts now agree. The first is that the great majority of the civilian population, especially women and children, survived the storming of the town by Cromwell. The second is that the vast majority of the soldiers defending it were slaughtered to a degree unusual even for the violence of the time. And the third is that there is no evidence at all that Cromwell positively ordered the killing of unarmed civilians, especially women and children. But there are two minor issues on which historians do disagree. And Tom is out of an extreme in these. Uh, one is whether some of the soldiers who were slaughtered inside the town surrendered on the promise of their lives and were then murdered, which would be breaking the rules of the time. And second, and more emotive, whether any unarmed civilians were killed when the town was stormed. And here Tom and I disagree over one detail alone, which is the evidence for this happening. Uh, I respect what I think is an eyewitness source which recounts this happening from one of Cromwell's soldiers. Tom discounts it. So really, the difference between us is over a detail compared with the amount in which we agree. Um, so let's come back to you, Tom. What, what, what are your comments on those points of disagreement? First of all, you, you, you might be quite struck by how far Professor Ronald Hutton has gone to meeting the research that you've done. Absolutely, I am. And, and you know, uh, Ronald and I have been in, in communication um, for some years about this. And, and, you know, we both have a huge amount of mutual respect for each other. He's not one of my embittered opponents, as he says, because there are plenty. And I get a lot of abuse and, and, and a lot of it is vitriolic. Um, but with that particular piece of evidence, I, I, and I'm very happy to reveal it on your show, Michael, um, recent evidence suggests that that gentleman, uh, and the name, is, the name of the guy is Thomas A. Wood, may not have even been in Drogheda. He is uh, uh, said to have been attached to uh, the regiment of Sir Henry Inglesby, whose regiments weren't, uh, they were posted to Bristol and Oxford during 1649. So there's even a uh, huge doubt over the fact that that guy who wrote uh, what uh, Professor Hutton thinks is an uh, uh, eyewitness attestation, it didn't appear in the public domain until 123 years after the event. What's more, it was written by his brother and it could easily have been um, um, changed or altered over the years by, by, over those intervening years by anybody. So it's just ambiguous. And like I say, if you take all of the other evidence, you have to discount Wood. Um, Professor Hutton, I don't terribly want to get into that detail any further at the moment, because I think we'll be losing uh, our viewers and listeners. But do you want to make a general point about how important it could be if this history is reassessed and if uh, a new consensus about what happened emerged? I think it could be very important, and here my sympathies are all on Tom's side. Uh, I was sitting in a hotel in Connemara in 1988, sipping morning coffee, and watching an audio-visual uh, guide to Ireland from the Irish Tourist Board. Uh, when it came to Drogheda, it said this was the setting for one of the blackest days in Irish history, when Oliver Cromwell's soldiers stormed the town and killed every man, woman, and child in the place. Now, this is an utter lie. And as Tom said, it's also taught in schools. So to propagate history that simply isn't true to visitors to Ireland and the Irish alike really does not help a partnership between the two nations. So I think Tom is doing a good thing in reining back some of the exaggerations that have been made about what happened that day at Drogheda. But I don't think Tom or I would wish to scaled down the horror of what happened in the slaughtering of the soldiers inside because the the killing at Drogheda was on a huge scale and arguably unnecessary so it, it, it was a dreadful incident but it wasn't the incident recounted in the generally accepted histories 
Uh, Tom, earlier on the program, we were talking about 1984. Uh, and of course, in that book, um, history has to be reworked uh, by the hero. It's part of his task uh, within the Ministry of Truth to retell history in a way that uh, suits the regime. But what prospect do you think there is now that uh, after the work that you've done and after the tone that you've heard Professor Ronald Hutton using about your work, that a new consensus might emerge? Well, I have to say, he's, he, to, not, to my mind, he's in the minority. There are very few historians who take the line he does that, that I've noticed. Um, and yeah, it, to, to me, this event took, um, took place maybe about 300 odd years ago. Um, and I think it could take that long, to be honest, before it flips on its head. But it's a historical miscarriage of, of, of justice. It's wrong. I'm trying to right a wrong. You know, I've, the books that I've written uh, endorse all of this. And um, it's just very frustrating to, to realise that long after I'm gone, um, you know, the, 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 it, might, it might come into the mainstream consciousness. Well, well, do you know, uh, I have found it just uh, so refreshing to have this very civilised conversation, uh, talking about evidence, trying to get towards the truth between two historians, one, uh, one professional, one amateur, and I congratulate you uh, both. It's an absolutely fascinating topic. Uh, Tom Riley and Professor Ronald Hutton, thank you both. Thank you. Uh, coming up, 